At Northrop Grumman, innovation isn't just an idea. It's a way of life. The value of performance. Northrop Grumman. So the title of my talk is Helping Us Age Successfully. What exactly does that mean? Well, if we're aging successfully, we want to be able to do what we want, when we want, where we want, how we want, and with whom you want. Just like you, right? You want to be able to do what you want and with whomever you want to do it. And these are a couple of people that are my models for successful aging. On the top is my mom, and that was on the day of her 80th birthday. And that's my dad, and he and I went to the Masters Golf Tournament when he was 75. And below that, I am at the top of Mount Kilimanjaro. And I am with my friend Nolan, who is 70 years old. And so these are my inspirations when I think about aging successfully. Let me tell you a little bit about my background. I started college at the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth, and I received my bachelor's of science, actually my bachelor of arts in psychology. And then I moved on to Georgia Institute of Technology, where I received my Master of Science in Psychology and my Doctor of Philosophy in Psychology. But the kind of psychology I do is a little bit different, and I want to tell you about that. So the areas of scientific study that I focus on include the psychology of aging. What happens to us as we get older? How do our physical abilities change? How do our cognitive abilities change? Maybe how do our attitudes and our preferences for things also change? The other part of what I do is called engineering psychology. And this is the study of people's interactions with products or systems or environments. And you can think of the shorthand label for this, designing for human use. So these are two kinds of psychology that you've probably never heard of before today. Now, I'm bringing that together into this field that's called human-robot interaction which is dedicated to understanding, designing, and evaluating robotic systems that are, are meant to be used by or with humans. And you can see I'm showing there's two parts of this. So there's the psychology side, the human side, and then there's the robotic side, the technology side. And so I collaborate with roboticists at Georgia Tech who actually build robots. Today we're going to talk about if the person using the robot is an older adult. So I want you to all think about your grandparents or your great aunts and uncles in the context of what I'm talking about. So how do we go about designing robots to support successful aging? Well, we need to think about what does the robot need to do? It needs to communicate with the human, and that might involve showing emotions in some way. It may need to perform tasks for the human, and it may even need to provide social support to the human. And we also need to think about what the robot looks like. So how important is that? So these are some of the research questions that we're investigating in my laboratory. And I'm going to introduce you to some of our robots and show you the work that we've been doing. So the first project I want to talk about is conveying emotion. So suppose we've built a robot that's intended to show emotion. We need to make sure that the people recognize the emotion that's being conveyed by the robot. So this is a robot called iCat. And it was designed by a company called Philips. And it was specifically designed to assess social aspects of robotics. So this robot can make faces. It can make facial expressions. It can move its eyebrows, its eyes, its head. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the iCat showing some emotion. And I want you to guess what the emotion is that the iCat is showing. What do you think? Okay. Some of you said sad before it even made a face. You're absolutely right. Now, the next two are actually a little more difficult. Ah, you hear a little bit of mixed views about this. Actually, it's intended to be showing surprise. OK, last one.
fear, very good. And you could tell, perhaps, because the iCat's eyes got big, right? So one of the things we've found with this research is that recognizing emotions sometimes is really easy. Everybody got happy, everybody got sad. But the fear and the surprise, those emotions are sometimes a little bit more subtle. And it's important to make sure that if your robot is, to, is supposed to be social and interacting with someone, that they recognize the motion that the robot is trying to convey. Okay, I want to introduce you to another robot. This robot's name is Gatsby. And that stands for the Georgia Tech Service Bot with Interactive Intelligence. So Gatsby. And it's a PR2 is what it's called, which is a personal robot. And it's intended to be a robot that might be in your home assisting you with things. So what we have done in some of our studies is to show older adults these capabilities of what a robot could do and then ask them, would you like a robot like that in your home? And if so, what would you want it to do for you? And so in one of our studies, we have a, a laboratory on the campus at Georgia Tech. It's called the Aware Home. It's an actual house, and we can test out different technologies in the home. Well, my colleagues programmed Gatsby to deliver medication to an older adult in the home. And what's exciting about this particular um, effort is that Gatsby is doing this autonomously. What that means is nobody is controlling. It's not like a remote control robot. Gatsby has been programmed to not navigate through the home on its own. And what it's doing is it's scanning for the person who's wearing what's called an RFID tag, a radio frequency identification tag. And the person who's wearing that tag is the person to whom Gatsby is going to give the medication. So there could be multiple people in the room, and Gatsby needs to know, well, which one is supposed to take the medication right now? And so Gatsby's finding the person, and again, not very quickly, but successfully. And then Gatsby will hand her the medication bottle. And she says, should I take it? Yes. And then now Gatsby has done its job, and it turns around and goes back to its room. So we were interested in whether the older adults might be frightened, right, by having this robot come so close to them. But it turned out that the older adults were very positive about the robot, they weren't frightened at all, and they were very excited about the potential of having this kind of robot in their home in the future. Okay, next question is, well, what do people want their robots to look like? The answer is it depends, right? So we asked people, how much would you like a robot with this kind of appearance to assist you with different tasks? So things like playing a game, making a decision, or doing chores for you. And then we also had them compare different robot faces. Well, which face would you like your robot to have? So I'm going to show you some, and then you get to choose, OK? So I want you to tell me, do you prefer one, two, three, or four? <laughs> There's a little bit of a mixture. I hear a lot of number threes, some number twos. All right. <laughs> so the main point is there's a lot of variety in what you're choosing. When we asked a group of college students at Georgia Tech, they liked number three the best, the younger adults. When we asked older adults which one they liked the best, they liked number one the best. So I heard a lot of you were also saying number two. So it really varies on what your preference is. Now these were robotic faces. We also showed faces that looked like humans, but we said this is the face of your robot. Which one do you like? So what do you like? One, two, three, or four? So in this case, there was actually agreement for number two, for both younger adults and older adults. That was their favorite. Then what we did is we morphed them together. So we took the human face and morphed it with the robot face. Now which one do you like? One, two, three, or four? A lot of variety. I see ones and twos and threes. Number one is what the younger adults liked, and number two is what the older adults liked. So there's a lot of differences of opinion. 
Now the next question was, does it depend on what the robot is supposed to do, right? So suppose I tell you that this robot is going to help you with your chores, like cleaning your home. Do you like column number one, the robot, column number two, or column number three? Most people in our study chose column number one for a robot that was going to be doing chores. But let's suppose the question is a social task. The robot's going to chat with you. Maybe it's going to play a game or teach you something. Now do you like one, two, or three? Three was what most people chose. Okay, now the last one was decision making. It's doing something like helping you to invest your money. Now what do you like? One, two, or three? Combination here, number two and number three. So think about this. So for both tasks that are more social or require more intelligence, people like their robot to look like it has some intelligence as well. For a task that is more doing chores or service kinds of things, well then they like it to look more like a machine. So what we found from these studies is that what people want their robot to look like differs, right? We saw that. It differs amongst people in the room. It differs between younger adults and older adults. It depends on what kind of task it is. So we need to keep this in mind as we move forward because it's going to be challenging to design robots that will be viewed positively by all people for all tasks. Okay, the last robot I want to introduce you to, if any of you have seen my card, this is the robot that's on my card. This robot's name is Paro. And Paro was specifically designed to be like a pet, but easier to take care of. So it was designed by a professor in Japan to elicit happiness and relaxation. And so it was meant to look like a baby harp seal, and it actually moves and makes sounds just like a seal, and I'll show you some video. And it has sensors, so it reacts if you pet it or touch it or talk to it, and it also can sense lights and touch and sound. So we asked older adults, what they thought of Paro and whether they would like to have Paro in their home. So do you like anything about Paro? Oh, I think he's really cute. It's something you could really just play with, you know, for mm -hmm. a definite period of time, just making him react to you. Yeah. Like that. It's almost like having a real pet in the house. Yeah. Okay, and the last one I want to show you was a fellow that he's a Georgia Tech grad, Georgia Tech alum from many years ago, and what we did was we left people in the room alone with Paro, and we gave him some paperwork to fill out, and this fellow was very serious, totally ignored the robot, filled out his paperwork, but then when he, when he was done with his job, this is what you'll see. Did you expect that? No. <laughs> so the older adults that we've tested so far really have interacted and engaged with Paro like that. Most of them liked it. One woman didn't like it at all because she doesn't like pets and she just didn't like it. That's fine. We'll, we'll find that with people. Um, but they thought it could be a mood boost or relaxing. And importantly, there would be low effort. So unlike a pet, it would be easy to take care of. So I think that robots have a lot of potential to support older adults. There are a lot of challenging research questions that remain to be answered, but in your lifetime, robots will play an important role in people's lives. So helping them with chores, teaching them new things, or being one of their friends. And you, in the future, can help design these robots and maybe even come and be a part of my team. This is my team today, and uh, it's a lot of fun to work on human-robot interaction. So.